So I'm here once again with Matt uh, for another video looking at some of his collection and what we have on the mannequin here is the kit of a Viet Cong, uh, well member of the, the Viet Cong basically, yeah. a female member of the Viet Cong in this instance by the nature of the, the mannequin itself. I'm going to run through the kit we have here, obviously we've got the black pyjamas and so forth and various items of equipment. Take it away Matt, run us through this in some sure. detail if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely, I'll do my best. Um, so I suppose best to start at the, the underlay, the actual clothing. Uh, this is uh, by dint of Hollywood mostly, widely regarded as like the de facto Viet Cong uniform. Uh, it's actually not a uniform, uh, it's not even military clothing. It's uh, what's known as, you figure my pronunciation, Vietnamese, Ao Ba Ba, which I think translates to uh, the clothing of anti, as in mm. a generic, a, a lady's clothing. It's, uh, it's distinctive, but it, at the basics, it's just a shirt and trousers. Uh, the trousers are very, very loose legged which is uh, what you want for an incredibly warm climate. Uh, the, very, the, the whole outfit is very lightly made. Cotton, very light weave, um, reasonably breathable. The black is maybe not the best choice for the middle of summer, but it's an easy colour to, to make. It doesn't show dirt particularly well. The tunic, top, the shirt even. Uh, long sleeves, pretty much always worn with the sleeves down. It's very, very, very rarely seen with the sleeves rolled up. Uh, it has a button up front, I can't remember how many buttons there are, but several, uh, and it's split, you can't really see very well because of all the equipment, split quite widely at the sides, um, very similar to another item of uh, Vietnamese clothing, traditional Vietnamese clothing, the Ao Dai, which is the long uh, white top and trousers that were often seen worn by women in the south, which is less practical as a combat uniform, but there we go. Um, so yeah, the Ao Ba Ba is the basic uniform. These were worn very, very commonly. They were traditional peasant wear in the south, particularly around the Mekong Delta. Uh, comfortable wear, practical, and crucially, were very, very useful for allowing the wearer to blend back in with the population. Obviously, once an operation had been carried out, uh, the equipment, the backpack, the belt, any, any extraneous gear would be dropped in a stash or just disposed of, and a person wearing this would be able to quite happily fade back into civilian life. Um, would not arouse suspicion untoward, really. Basically, it's civilian clothing. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, no less, it's no more a uniform than what me or you are wearing now, to yes. be honest. It's just day clothes for a, a, manual, a manual worker in South Vietnam. Uh, so, that's the outfit. Uh, the next thing that's of note, I suppose, is the scarf. Again, excuse the pronunciation, this is the Canran scarf. Uh, originally, this is going to cause some consternation, these were originally, hundreds of years ago, a thing across Southeast Asia, particularly Cambodia, and they were adopted by most people in that area, that region. Uh, the Vietnamese version is the Canran. It's checkered, and it always, they always have a, a differently coloured weave just across here. In this case, it's red. The black and, the black and white checker with the red markings is probably the most common version. There is some uh, train of thought that the different coloured scarves denoted either different units, different specialisations or different regional uh, forces and that these would be used as an identifier. If a group wearing one coloured scarf came into an area, any forces in that area would be able to say, oh yeah, these guys are from somewhere else and they would be able to identify each other like that. Uh, so that's that. These are worn as scarves, they can be tied around the head underneath the, the conical hat, which is uh, not another item of not combat wear that Hollywood has convinced us all everybody wore all the time, they didn't. Uh, or it can be worn around the waist sometimes as a sort of sash. You can sometimes carry things in it or just keep it around the waist out of the way. Uh, in this case it's just worn as a, a sort of scarf, sweat cloth around the neck. Uh, now, sort of hung on the neck here, this is a, a replica TT33 pistol for the Chinese equivalent, the Type 54. Um, you'll notice it's on a piece of cord which doesn't look particularly official, and it's not, but it's based on a photograph I've seen of a lady carrying one. And the thinking is, the cord is only just tied around the front of the slide here and attached to the, uh, the lanyard loop on the grip. And so in, in combat, all that I need to do is to slide that off there, and then it could be wielded as is, uh, again. An improvised solution, like a lot of the, uh, the Viet Cong's gear was. They were necessities of mother of invention, the Viet Cong had to do a lot of inventing. Uh, the hat is one of a number of different types of uh, boonie hats, boonie style hats that the Vietnamese wore. 
These were common to both the, uh, the PAVN, the North Vietnamese Standing Army, and the various guerrilla forces in the South. Uh, there are two types, predominantly two types. This is what's known as the, uh, the stiff brim, because the, the brim is stiff. Uh, the other type has a much floppier brim and is sometimes known as, I believe it's the flower type, because it, it tends to fold and undulate in a way that resembles flower. Uh, these are distinct from Western types, those used by the Allies, which tend to have a flat plate in the, the crown and the sides attached to that, whereas this is made out of triangles of fabric which are sewn to a central point. Uh, usually More akin to earlier Western designs, like the Daisy May and things oh, like right, that. Oh, yeah, so sure. It draws on US, yeah. uh, well, it, the US had a similar design yeah, earlier on, but yeah. obviously still manufactured. Entirely in possible that some of those early designs came through with the French, mm. and it was based on that. But this is, this is a Vietnamese manufacture. Uh, obviously made its way down to the south as an item of headwear. As I say, the conical, uh, the rice paddy hat, the non la, as it's known in Vietnamese, would not have been worn as combat wear because it's completely useless in such a situation. It's very large and provides excellent shade and protection from the weather. We lose. could do with some today. We, we, we really, really could, it's very, very warm. <laughs> um, it provides, like I say, excellent protection from the weather, but it has no ballistic protection. It lacks any sort of liner or harness or anything like that, so it's not especially comfortable if you're being conducting vigorous activity uh, and it also completely negates any sort of upward vision and because they tend to come down quite low you lose a lot of situational awareness anyway so they would have been worn when traveling by main force or when off duty in disguise but in combat they would have been discarded as completely useless and probably dangerous for the wearer to have so that covers the basic outfit. Uh, I suppose we should move on to the webbing. Yes, we've talk, talked about the weapon as well. Sure. So, well, one thing we might talk about while talking about the clothing is, is the oh, sandals. Oh, we might as well do as the well, shoes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk about the sure, so uh, I'll bring them up so you can see. These are what are known in Vietnamese as, I believe, Detlop, or Zetlop, I suppose the pronunciation is. Um, car tire sandals, they're an iconic piece of equipment. And unlike the conical hat, which everybody assumes was worn, and but it's become a sort of byline these were actually as prevalent as media would have you believe um the north vietnamese army the pavn soldiers were issued a set of boots and also a set of these sandals uh supposedly for off duty wear around around base camps but because the boots were prone to getting wet and causing foot problems the sandals were preferred for marching and all sorts and you see them quite often in combat as well throughout the war um the Viet Cong would have worn these quite widely. They were also worn by civilians. So again, doesn't stand out as a, an item of military equipment that might give one away. The, the, the sole is cut from tire treads, various types of tires and tractors, trucks, cars. As long as it's got a tread and it's rubber. Uh, some of these you will see uh, still have uh, cords running through them that would have reinforced them when they were a tire. Uh, the straps, these are a mid-war type. There are various other patterns of straps that appear later on and earlier in the war. Um, are made out of inner tubes. And they can be adjusted. You'll notice they stick through the bottom here. Ordinarily, you cannot move them. It's rubber fighting against rubber, so they're extremely secure. Even though they're not glued or stapled or fastened in any way. To adjust them, you pull the rubber, so it thins it, and then you can adjust the straps back and forth. So these would have been very common. Um, Closed footwear was very, very uncommon. Occasionally you'd see captured Arvon boots, but they would have to be discarded when the fighter was trying to integrate back into society to hide, because it had been a dead giveaway. Uh, in the Mekong Delta in particular, it wasn't uncommon to see no shoes at all. The entire area is very, very swampy. Most of the people who fought there lived there and were rural, uh, from farms, rice farms, and would have been used to not wearing any shoes at all, so it wasn't really any loss. Uh, but those are the sandals. That's Yeah, that's the last the part of the uniform. Final part of the basic uniform. Yeah. What might have been construed as day-to-day -day wear. Really. Yes. Uh, so onto the webbing. We'll just move the, the hat, the hat and the tocker out of the way. So, just... so uh, webbing is from a variety of sources. As I say, the Vietnamese were forced to improvise on a huge scale uh, because the South Vietnamese were largely dependent on supplies brought down from the north, uh, especially after the initial phase of the war was open and supplies of equipment left behind by the Viet Minh or catch from the French were dried up, had been used up, they were forced to rely on stuff being brought down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which as vast and successful a supply route as that was, was not always reliable or consistent. So all sorts of equipment appear, Chinese made, uh, leftovers from the Indochina War, 
a few items of North Vietnamese construction, you have to remember the North Vietnamese did not have a huge amount of industry during the war, and what industry they did have was routinely bombed by the Americans. So you more often see stuff from abroad used by the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese manufactured equipment. So if we go to the right side first, sort of sleeve out of the way. On the hanging off the shoulder here in a little web carrier is a Chinese Type 65 canteen, as the name uh, denotes. These were introduced in the 1960s. Uh, we're completely widespread in China by this point. Um, we're imported into Vietnam in huge numbers. It's uh, an enameled metal canteen, a baker like lid with a rubber stopper inside. The, the cord attaches it to the, the little carrier so that you can't lose the lid. Um, and as, as I say, it's carried on a shoulder strap. It doesn't attach to the belt at any point. It's normally tucked under the belt. Obviously, if it wasn't and you were running around, it'd be flapping all over the place, potentially causing injury or tripping you up or getting tangled on things. Um, other types were used. You occasionally see captured Arvan, American, or other Allied Forces canteens. They were quite widely used and um, were quite liked. They'd be hung off the belt, which in this case, if I move the pouch out, at least you can see it a little better, is a web belt, quite a thick web belt. And on the front is, I don't know if you can see it particularly well, a brass buckle with the star, which is a North Vietnamese identifier, or sorry, Vietnamese communist identifier, I should say. Uh, again, this would have had to have been thrown away or hidden once the, uh, the fighter moved out of combat. Otherwise, it would have been a dead giveaway. Trouble would ensue. One thing to mention with the canteen, of course, is it's a good example of the, the level of uh, aid that was being received yes. from China is it's not just weapons and higher tech items, it's basic field Absolutely. gear like canteens were being provided the, the to the North uh, Vietnamese. Kong. They weren't wholly dependent on Chinese aid, but they received huge amounts. And, and like Simon says, it's from the, the very basic up to the, up to the, the really advanced stuff came from the Soviet Union, the missiles, the fighter jets, yes. generally speaking. Um, but things like canteens, uniform items, uh, bandages, web, web gear, medical supplies, yeah. even things like toothpaste and canteens. Uh, uh, rations, I should say, tinned rations and canteens were imported from China in huge quantities. Uh, as I say, Vietnam didn't have a huge amount of heavy industry. It certainly wouldn't have been enough to supply both the army and the guerrillas in the south. So aid was much appreciated and very, very vital. On the belt, turning back to the, back to the right again, we have a US M1 carbine pouch, a lift the dot fastener, two compartments. Uh, the M1 carbine was beloved by the Viet Cong. They were widely used by the Arvin and were hugely available uh, as both battlefield, battlefield scavenge, uh, covered from battlefields after fighting, or uh, the Arvin supply chain was not known for being particularly incorruptible, and it was not uncommon for Viet Cong fighters to find sympathisers within the Arvin structure and smuggle, buy, barter, otherwise acquire weapons from uh, quartermasters who were looking the other way. Yes. Supplies fell off the back of trucks quite often. Um, they were particularly popular with the rear echelon forces and again our ammunition wasn't particularly uncommon because they were so widely used in the south uh, so the m1 carbine was not standardized but was fairly close to being one of the more common weapons that the Viet Cong used. certainly favored yeah, yeah. absolutely it, it suits the proportions yes ta in a tactical role it's got enough power for what's required short range combat and ambush uh, doesn't recoil too heavily reasonably yeah. capacious magazine ideal uh, on the other side if we turn around we have the sleeve out of the way again, yep. the scarf out of the way. We have a Vietnamese uh, grenade carrier. This is similar to the Chinese type, but it's a local manufacturer. It's a little bit different. The Chinese ones are generally taller and have a, uh, a cover that goes over the base of the grenades to stop them catching on things. This is this has a, a cord around the front. It's a little bit tight. Let me just adjust um, to stop the grenades from falling out. They're just tucked in there. I will say it's easier to get grenades out of this than the Chinese type because the Chinese one you have to sort of pull them back so far, unhook them, and then push them out. It's a little awkward. This one you can just whip them straight out and throw a grenade. Uh, we also have a, an M1, uh, sorry, the US uh, compass or medical pouch. Again, these were just used for carrying small items. Uh, the Viet Cong generally, the local force tended not to carry any rations at all. We just had a small amount of water. <clears throat> Main force generally relied on supplies they could collect from local friendly villages or stashes, a small amount of rice, cooked food. Uh, generally tended not to carry huge amounts of food. So that you wouldn't need any any large haversack or other pouches for carrying uh, tin food or ration packs or anything like that. Uh, you might notice here, just visible on the side here, this is a rice carrier. I know so they don't carry a lot of food, but what food they did carry tended to be dried rice, which was carried in this. It's basically a sack. It was sometimes nicknamed the elephant's trunk because when the tide up and loaded with rice, 
they sort of look that way. These were usually worn looped over the top of the backpack, and obviously this is empty at the minute, but... Uh, Move that around now, yeah, as you can see here. Uh, they would be worn, the backpack would obviously be more full with equipment, would stick out slightly and he would rest across the top, full of rice, uh, and would provide supplies for several days of marching, and uh, a, a short campaign at least. Um, these were sometimes also worn over the shoulder, the backpack wasn't worn or tied around the waist, especially if they weren't fully loaded, because uh, fully loaded they're quite heavy. The backpack is of North Vietnamese manufacture, this one marks, has a, uh, an NLF, NLF uh, Viet Cong uh, patch, identification patch. Uh, these were usually worn for identification, if you were going along a jungle trail and somebody came on behind you, they would need to know who they were following, obviously to avoid friendly fire. If Allied forces also ended up on the trail, it'd also give away they were facing Viet Cong or following Viet Cong, I should say. It's got three pockets, uh, one on each side. These are tie fastened. Uh, another one there. The central pocket, these were used by the PAVN as well, and in P PAVN service, the central pocket would be used to hold the mess tin. Uh, general supplies found inside for main force fighters would have been things like ground sheets, hammocks, mosquito nets. Uh, you'd also find cleaning kits with razors, combs, mirrors. Uh, toothpaste, toothbrushes, uh, and other personal effects. You sometimes even find little red books um, inside the backpacks, but they were fairly uncommon. So, yeah, I think that about sums up yes. the Viet Cong fighter she's dressed up here. And this is relatively well equipped. Yes, sort yes. Of, I would say sort of maybe mid-war? Mid Middle-late war. Mid -late war. Yeah. Because you've, you've obviously collected some US accoutrements and things yeah. here. Yeah. Um, the Viet Cong were thrown into the Tet Offensive in 1968 as a bit of a gamble by the North Vietnamese Command and were not really equipped or designed or prepared to be a frontline combat force and were largely expended. The effect was the effect the Vietnamese wanted was achieved. It caused a massive propaganda victory for them, uh, turned the opinion in America against the war and caused huge amounts of unrest there. But as a fighting force, the Viet Cong in its original iteration of being northern aligned southern based guerrillas under northern control evaporated and Viet Cong post 1968 tended to be uh, largely North Vietnamese infiltrators. That had been happening for a while leading up to 68 but after 68 the southern guerrillas largely collapsed. Uh, but yeah she's she's fairly well equipped uh, earlier on in the war and even up to this point you'd sometimes see them just carrying a belt maybe a canteen maybe not even that. Um, generally a shorter operation, a short ambush or a patrol, something to carry your ammunition and that was about all you needed. If you got into a heavy fight and you ran out, you start to run out of ammunition, you'd withdraw. The Viet Cong were very good at fighting on their own terms, didn't allow themselves to be corralled, uh, so they wouldn't need huge amounts of ammunition for protracted fighting. Uh, likewise, no real need for rations or large amounts of food for support or medical supplies. They were likely equipped, they were a guerrilla force, they would fight and fade, they weren't equipped to do large campaigns but yeah that's that's what she's got thank you very much indeed Matt very welcome so hopefully you found it interesting looking at this obviously this is one in the series of videos that I've been making with Matt running through bits from his collection which is very kind of him if you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already and whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed please do make sure you hit the little bell the notification button down below and of course that will alert you when I upload future videos I think that's everything for this video so until next time Bye for now.